Welcome everyone to the Bunkey Clinic Virtual Visiting Professor Series. Um, this morning I, I have the uh, uh, distinct pleasure of welcoming a very dear friend of mine, Dr. Evan Garfine, um, who is Chief of Plastic Surgery at the, at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Um, I've known Evan for, for many years and it's really an honor to have him. Um, unfortunately, it's not as good as having him in person, but hopefully we'll, have, we'll be able to have him here in person soon as well. Uh, just a quick background before we get started uh, with Dr. Garfine's lecture. Um, Dr. Garfine obtained his MD uh, from the Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons. Um, he then moved to Boston where he completed general surgery at uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital um, and then completed plastic surgery at the Harvard program, which as we know is one of the premier programs in the, in the country, and then completed a microsurgery fellowship um, at New York U University. Um, and after that, he uh, um, moved to Einstein and, and he's become a chief of plastic surgery there. On a personal level, um, I've known Evan, as I'd mentioned for, for a, a number of years, and I've had the pleasure of, of working with him on, um, on a few programs. Um, specifically, many of you have seen uh, me uh, talk about this meeting because we've had a few of our um, faculty from this meeting join us, but um, we, we really had a great time in Patagonia. Evan uh, was one of our faculty and, and, and it was really fantastic have, having him there. And I think, one of the best parts of it was learning how to fly fish uh, from Dr. Garfine. He's an expert fly fisherman and he even brought out all of his own gear. Um, and so it was just really a phenomenal time to not only um, learn about plastic surgery and teach and, and, and uh, obviously make new friends and, and reinforce existing ones, um, but, uh, um, but also spend a lot of time um, outside of the lecture hall and the cadaver lab. Um, Evan, thanks so much for being with us. Uh, it's really an honor to have you. Um, hopefully we'll be able to have you here in person as well. Um, but until then, this, I guess, is going to have to do. Well, thank you very much. Uh, that's an incredibly kind introduction. Um, you know, it's, it's really a singular honor to have been invited to speak with you today. Um, I've often thought that the Bunky Clinic is sort of my platonic form of what a microsurgery group department should be be. Um, not only because of the history and um, obviously the volume and the results, but perhaps uh, more importantly, uh, everyone I've met over the years uh, from Bunky has been the kind of surgeon uh, I would like to be one day and uh, with whom I would certainly like to work. And I, I have, as we, when I became chief at Montefiore and Einstein, um, it was very top of mind for me to try in a uh, four way, whatever way I could to build something like what you have out there. And so uh, it's really a tremendous honor to speak with you today. Uh, I, I didn't really know what I wanted to talk about. Um, and so I'm going to let you in on, on sort of my thought process. Obviously, you know, I, I've titled the talk uh, Reimagining Improvement in Surgery, uh, the Role of Deliberate Practice, and we're going to talk about that. But I, I had a couple of alternative ideas. Um, one of them was uh, I, I was going to share with you my 50-year experience with finger replantation. Um, you know, I think it may not be as impressive as uh, funky clinics, but I think it's, it's still pretty good. You know, I just turned 50, and um, and then I was going to talk about the state of the art phalloplasty. You know, in my hands, it's just another digit. Um, <laughs> but I decided not to talk about either of those, um, and I really want to talk about something that maybe cuts closer to home. Uh, and so here is your intrepid leader uh, on the rivers of Patagonia, uh, catching a massive, uh, a massive rainbow trout. Um, it was a tremendous trip, by the way. Uh, the highlight was clearly spending time uh, with, with uh, old and new friends. I couldn't agree more. Uh, but I want to talk about how we can make Dr. Safa even better. I know that to those of you who work with him and those of you who are aware of his uh, reputation and of his acumen may uh, think that that's impossible. And I have to say that for years and years and years, I thought that was impossible too. But I think now that it is something we can explore and, uh, and I want to approach that in this talk. My disclosures are that I'm a founder of uh, Sigma Surgical and Manifest Surgery and um, 
we're not really going to talk much about that today, uh, and that I'm probably just an average surgeon. So I don't know that I can impart too much in terms of wisdom to this August group, but I'm going to at least share some thoughts. So the last several months have been really disruptive. Um, and so they've been disruptive for lots of people. Let me move that over. Uh, you know, certainly here in New York, they were incredibly disruptive, uh, especially early on. The top picture uh, was uh, is a picture of me in front of a tent in our uh, ER parking lot uh, doing general medical exams. It's been quite a while since I did a general medical exam, uh, so it was sort of an interesting opportunity. Uh, the bottom picture is actually a picture of um, Rudy Buntik on the beach earlier this week uh, doing early morning yoga practice. Uh, and I think, you know, this is um, this pandemic has given us time to sort of reset priorities, time to think creatively about what we do. The goal for the talk today is um, not so much to give you answers to any big questions, but um, may maybe just pose some interesting questions. And uh, at the end of this, I'd like to begin the process with you of reimagining surgery as something better. We're going to come back to this group, but I wanted to introduce them to you. This um, is a picture of two of my friends from University of Texas uh, at South Southwestern, uh, Nicholas Haddock and Sumi Teosha. Uh, and this is a picture they sent me recently. Uh, and they didn't give me any context for the picture, so I didn't really know what to what it was referring. And, and so I wrote back, I said, you know, was this, uh, was this a pretty involved back change? And, and Sumit said, no. And then I said, well, was, were you, was it a suture removal, you know, in two hours and 14 minutes? I've done a couple of those over the years. And they said, no. And I said, well, what was it? And they said, well, this was our latest time for a bilateral deep flap. Um, and um, here's a team uh, that did it, two residents, a scrub tech, and two attendings. So we'll come back to them and, and to that idea. Um, so I, I sort of think we have a big hairy problem, uh, and that's not my beard or, or my you know, nascent mullet, uh, but the big hairy problem is that none of us is as good as we could be in surgeon, in surgery. Um, and perhaps that doesn't matter, although I, I think it does. And I, I think certainly if you were a patient, you would think that it matters. Um, and I think this problem is compounded by the fact that there's no great mechanism for fixing this problem. We're going to cover sort of some of the reasons why I think this is the case, uh, how I can defend this sort of radical supposition. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about our model versus a model in sports, and I know sort of all analogies break down eventually, um, but some are useful for certain things, and we're going to explore that. We're going to talk a little bit about what a better model might look like, and here is where I'm going to make the case for deliberate practice. Um, and, and then lastly, we're, we're going to talk about uh, what Nicholas and Sumit are doing uh, in Dallas. So to begin, you know, I think one of our big problems in surgery is that there's historical confusion between the importance of knowledge and skill. Uh, you know, knowledge is um, how one might do something or the facts around the pursuit you're involved in. The skill is being able to actually do it. And when you think about surgery, if you go up to 100,000 feet and look down on surgery, capital S, um, there's a lot of importance that we place on knowledge. We select surgeons based on knowledge and we certify surgeons based on knowledge and we continue to educate surgeons based on knowledge. And there is a paucity of um, analytic rigor around the skill that actually goes into being uh, a surgeon and doing what we do every day. Another problem is that our outcomes are, are just much too different from one another. If you look across industries, no other industry tolerates the amount of outcome variance that we do in surgery. And so the left chart is 
a chart from Marty McCarry, one of Marty McCarry's books on, uh, on complication variance. And there's like a 4X variance in observed to expected complication rates across the country. Um, that's huge, right? Car, the car industry doesn't behave that way. Um, the, uh, you'll see at the sports at the highest levels don't behave that way. Um, and we sort of tolerate it because that's always been the way we do things and we don't really have tools to address it, but hopefully uh, we're gonna start to have those tools and more importantly, have the will to address these issues. In surgery, we tend not to practice. Um, you know, I think we, we, uh, we play a lot of games, but uh, it's always game time for surgeons. There's always a patient on the table. Once you, uh, once you finish your training, and even uh, during training, one could argue, we don't do a lot of practicing. Uh, we do a lot of repetition, and we're going to come back to that as one of the central differences between naive and deliberate practice. Our processes, our outcomes, and the way we manage complications um, are largely in a black box. This is changing a little bit, uh, but still not nearly to the level uh, it could be or should be. Uh, just for fun, I, I, I did a little bit of plumbing on uh, the, the publicly available information on uh, some of the luminaries at Funky Clinic. And uh, Babak came up here, and this is from ProPublica. And you could imagine that if you had a problem that needed uh, expert microsurgical care, uh, and you want to really figure out how good a doctor, how good a surgeon Dr. Safa was, this would be an incredibly useful page for you, right? I mean, the thing that I always think about when trying to find a good surgeon or, or refer someone to a good surgeon is um, how many services they perform, the total amount paid by Medicare. I mean, I have no idea what this means even. I, and I can't possibly imagine how this would help someone figure out how good uh, Bowback was. Surgeons are uh, excellent at making excuses. We've had lots of practice as a profession. Um, you know, if you ask 100 surgeons why surgeons are different, you'll, you'll get some smattering uh, of, of these four uh, categories. Well, there's obviously talent. How good are your hands? Um, there's training. You know, not everyone can train at Bunky Clinic, so pretty much everyone else is at a disadvantage. There's intrinsic knowledge. Um, I just, I've read more, I've written more, um, I know more, uh, so I must be a better surgeon. And then lastly, and most importantly, it's well, you know, my, my patients are more complicated um, and, and uh, they're sicker, they're fatter, they all smoke, they're all irradiated. Um, and that either excuses my not so good results or it makes the fact that I do get results, good results, even more impressive. So we're very good at this. Um, these are all comments that I've received over the years in, in one way or another. Uh, you know, surgeons will tell you, I, I can't possibly tell you what makes me so good. Um, I'm, I, I may be touched by the hand of God. I, I don't know. Um, operating is an art. Um, it's not something that I can discuss with you. I, I don't want to tell you how good I am or what makes me special because then you'll set up shop across the street and I won't be able to pay the mortgage. Um, a lot of surgeons say, you know, look, I am highly critical of my own results. I, I will look at them and try to figure out how to get better. Okay, that's sort of a half step. Not a very good one, though, if you look at how other people get better. Some surgeons will say, well, I do have other surgeons watch me. I mean, my residents are always with me. Mm, okay, it's a little bit like having the, the kids in school critique the professor uh, and uh, help him uh, become a, a, better, a better professor um, while they're in the process of, of being taught. It's a little bit difficult. Um, so we have a big problem here. It, it's just not set up. We're not set up efficiently to get better. Um, I think some of this is uh, denial. I think we, um, we've, we've lived in sort of privileged territory for a long time. Uh, the OR is sort of a, a, uh, an off-limits 
location in most hospitals. A lot of hospital administrators are afraid of surgeons. We're obviously drivers of revenue, so you want to sort of tread lightly. Um, the system is broken, I think, because we simply haven't had to change. Uh, there, there's been no external force to make us do this. Uh, change is always or almost always painful and hard. It takes effort to do this. And so if you don't have to change, most people in most pursuits don't. Um, outcomes analysis that will drive the need to change are only a relatively recent phenomenon. Sort of outcomes research came out of Harvard School of Public Health in the 70s and 80s in medicine and maybe the next two decades in surgery, but, but it's really a recent phenomenon. So, so uh, we're, we're new at it. There are psychological barriers, obviously. It's not easy to, to admit that you, you might need to change even if you've been doing something for a long time and have a uh, fancy press on your card and um, maybe drive a nice car. Um, it's entrenched in our culture. And obviously there are very powerful economic forces that uh, have, uh, have made change less likely, namely the fact that um, you know, un until recently and still to this day in many parts of the country, um, we get paid for complications too. And so there's not a, a really powerful force saying, well, if you're not that good or you can get better, um, you, you better take the time and spend the energy to do that. Um, we're not there yet. So I want to, I want to ask you to imagine a world that's a little bit different. Um, so some of you may know who this is. This is um, Neutron Jack Welch. And when he took over GE, um, he, uh, GE was struggling and he, um, he had a bunch of radical or, or what at the time were radical ideas. And one of them was, uh, well, if you're in the bottom 10% in your division, of GE, um, we're gonna fire you. And we're not gonna do that once, we're gonna do that every year. And that's how we're gonna get better. We're gonna get rid of the people who are, are simply not good. And it'll be good for GE, but it will also be good for those people because it's not good to not be good. And so um, everyone thought this was incredibly radical, um, and some people still do, but imagine if uh, you're out in, practice and you're in the bottom 10% of plastic surgeons doing an, a particular operation uh, and someone came to you and said, you know what, Evan, you, you can't do this operation anymore, um, at least not until you get better. Uh, it, would, it would be different. Imagine if you got paid zero dollars if you were bad. So not your salary, not something, but zero. Imagine if they were really uh, a, uh, a a biting financial incentive to improve. Or imagine if instead of sort of having your outcomes be uh, largely invisible to your customers or to your the people who pay you, imagine if it were really transparent and everyone saw you, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I think we would be different. Uh, so some people would say, and maybe some people who are listening today would say, well, surgery is different, Evan. It, it's, it doesn't quite fit any of these common, uh, you know, uh, pop psychology, pop management book analogies like sports or the music industry or the financial services industry, aviation, learning chess. It's all, they're all different, right? They're all different. And surgery is not really like any of these. Maybe that's possible, but um, let, let's let's kick the tires on that a little bit. And so the the analogy I want to explore uh, just briefly is that of sports. Um, and we, I want to talk about what surgeons do uh, and what athletes do, what the basic assumptions of those two pursuits are. Uh, I want to discuss how the process by which we become surgeons and the process by which athletes become athletes, or at least professional athletes, uh, expert athletes. Uh, what are the measurements of achievement? So how do we determine whether someone has reached the level of expert in these two areas? So I have a couple of clips for you. Today, we will be removing the patient's appendix. The first step in an operation of this particular type is 
to shave the patient. Forget it, forget it, get on with it. So that reminds me of some, some of the people I trained with, uh, some of the people I've trained maybe. Um, so what, as surgeons, we operate, right? As we take care of people, we care for them. We teach. Uh, and so here are two of the great educators of the 20th century. I know you probably recognize the gentleman on the right. Uh, the gentleman on the left, anyone know? Osler. Um, Right, so, so teaching is part of what we do. We innovate, right? Innovation is a, a big part of, of surgery and uh, it's sort of one of the, I think, most enjoyable, uh, interesting, fun parts of what we do, certainly in plastic surgery uh, with uh, the vac dressing and Louis Argenta, um, you know, but think about the innovations around laparoscopy and what's going on in, in vascular medicine and cardiac surgery. Uh, innovation is sort of a, a, a constant drumbeat. What do athletes do? So athletes do sort of a, a similar body of things. They, they learn how to play their sport and they, they build skill and fitness levels, uh, muscle mass, coordination, they practice, they compete in games, they innovate also, Fosbury flop, right? Uh, the, uh, the dunk. Uh, and they also sort of have their academic arm in terms of teaching and coaching. In surgery, you know, the, the basic assumptions, all things being equal, are that we should continuously strive to get better, right? I think that is a, that's a safe sort of assumption. Uh, we should continuously strive to get better. No matter how good you are at doing what you do, you should strive to get better. Uh, I think it's safe to say that all things being equal, it is better to be better than worse. I think your patients would certainly agree. Uh, I think it's difficult to become an expert in surgery. It's not a trivial undertaking. Um, so that takes effort and thought and focus. We're not all equal, that's obvious. Um, and I think quality matters. In sports, um, athletes also continuously strive to get better. Uh, it's better to be better than worse. It's difficult to become an expert. Athletes are not all equal and quality matters, at least to the athletes, their teams, and the fans who follow them. We become uh, surgeons through sort of an interesting path. If you, again, go up to 100,000 feet and look down on it, uh, you're, you're good in high school science uh, and you're, you, you make nice experiments in chemistry class and you uh, show enthusiasm when you dissect a uh, fetal pig. Um, so you get into a good college and then you take your organic chemistry and, and do well there and, and sign up for the MCAT and score very well. Uh, you go to residency because you were smart and you have good grades and uh, scored well on your tests. And then if you're, if you're good during residency, which, well, you know, let's face it, in a lot of uh, cases means that you're sort of liked and you're a good person, a hard worker, honest, um, and have good scores on your in-service tests, you can get a good fellowship. Um, maybe not a great one like, like the Bunky Clinic, but you can get a good fellowship. Um, and then you become a surgeon. So pretty much this entire path is predicated on uh, integrating knowledge and being able to show that you've acquired knowledge in an effective uh, way. Becoming an athlete is sort of different, right? So here's a picture of young Leo Messi on the top left in Argentina and very early on he was uh, identified as, uh, as a, uh, an unusual talent and, and the, the uh, Barcelona Academy picked him up as a, as a young man, as a very young man, young teen, um, preteen actually, and had him come over to Barcelona and study and play soccer there and, and, and throughout his entire arc to becoming the best in the world, he has been observed and coached and practiced and, and, uh, and moved along. But I don't think anyone has ever 
ask Leo Messi to take a test on soccer. I don't think he's ever taken a written exam. Um, I don't know that his knowledge of the game in its strictest form is what people are interested in. What, what people are interested in and, and the way he's moved along is by being a great, great soccer player. And that is sort of apparent to anyone who's, who has ever watched him from the time he was four years old in Argentina until today. Surgical draft is a little different, right? So we draft players to the professional leagues. You know, if, if you think getting into your residency is sort of the, the semi-pro or pro professional league in surgery, um, we draft people who have never played this sport. And so it's sort of curiosity, I would think. Um, again, we sort of try to find surrogates, but um, we draft people who have never played the sport of surgery. In sports, people have uh, an unbelievable amount of information about the people they're drafting, uh, and they put them through psychological tests and biochemical tests, and, and they time them, and they watch them, and they dissect them. Uh, and so it's a much more sort of rational process. But you know, I guess you could argue that it's much more important that you don't make a mistake in drafting an outside lineman then you make a mistake drafting someone who's going to operate on you uh, in a few short years. I guess maybe it's just more important. Stats and sports are really robust. Uh, you know, here's just a tiny smattering of the, of, of the data people have compiled to defend the fact that Messi is such a great player. Um, stats in surgery are present and they're getting better, but they're really not that good. Uh, so, the top is a, a spreadsheet from the NISQIP database, um, and it sort of shows which surgeons are yellow and red and green. Um, and it, it, there's a lot of data in NISQIP, and, and it's getting more and more uh, fleshed out, but how much of it is actionable, I don't really know. Um, this is, again, from ProPublica and it's California Pacific Medical Center for knee hip replacement and prostate uh, resection. And again, I, you know, the, this, the data are not so granular, I think, to help you really make an informed decision if you were a patient. And certainly if you're a, a surgeon, neither of these two data sets will help me get better if I wanna identify someone who I wanna emulate, and that's a problem. Achievement in sports is obvious and clear, right? It's how many MVP awards you win, the championships you win, maybe the contract you get, sort of clear. Achievement in surgery is less clear. Um, how do you know a surgeon is a great surgeon? Uh, I was asked recently by someone uh, to recommend a plastic surgeon in my division for something I don't do. And I recommended someone and then I, I walked away and I sort of thought, I don't really know that that person is so good at that. I mean, I, I think they are, but the, the, my basis for thinking that that person was great at that operation was sort of fuzzy. I, I hadn't seen the last 100 outcomes they've had for doing that operation. I don't actually, I haven't seen, you know, the last 10. I haven't seen, you know, we don't do that in surgery. So recommending someone is sort of a fuzzy uh, process. We can get an idea of how good a surgeon someone is by maybe what car they drive, or if you're flying on Delta, you open up the magazine. This is how I personally uh, keep a list of who the best plastic surgeons in America are, because it says these are the best plastic surgeons in America. So uh, obviously that's a pretty easy- Less or 10 minutes. Um, please turn your microphones off during the talk. Um, okay, I just got it. Go ahead. Um, patient reviews are a great way to figure out who's a who's a good surgeon. I mean, if you look at that top one, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I think I am very kind, and I, I think I do have a good personality, maybe even a great personality. Um, and I, my mom thinks, and my wife think that I'm, I am quite skilled at what I do. Um, and then unfortunately I scroll down and it turns out that someone doesn't think I'm five stars, someone thinks I'm horrible. Um, and so 
if, if you know, I was just sort of looking at this from outside, I guess I'm somewhere between five stars and horrible. I, I don't, I'm not sure this really helps. In sports, the road to improvement is transparent uh, and clear, right? So how do people get better in sports? Well, you, there's a, a level of intrinsic introspection, uh, there's self-evaluation, um, there's critical evaluation from other people, your coaches or uh, people who play on, on a team with you. Uh, there's deliberate practice, and we'll get to what that really means, but certainly sports is sort of built on deliberate practice, not naive practice. Coaching plays an enormous role. Um, and, you know, importantly, how you are as an athlete um, is clear to everyone. There's no, there's no mystery to it. There, no one thinks that, well, this person is known as a great athlete, but he's actually not a great athlete. Um, it, it's obvious, it's incontrovertible. In surgery, it, it's really different. So, and, and much worse, I would argue. So self-reflection, uh, when you talk to, when I have talked to you throughout the last couple of months of this process, surgeons who I really respect, and I've, I've asked them, how, how do you get better? Um, almost uniformly, the answer I get, or one of the answers I get is, well, self-reflection. I, I look at my results, I try to figure out what I can do better. Um, I read the journal, I go to conferences, um, and, and I, I try to figure it out and I'm driven to always improve, right? And, and that is the best of us, right? The best of us will say, I am driven to continuously improve. I am driven to be reflective and to, to be critical of my results to try to get better. And that's super important. But that is, that's not the best way to get better, right? That's like saying, you know, you can be driven to become a better athlete, but if you rely on self-reflection as the only tool you have to get better, you're not gonna get better as quickly or as completely as you might. Um, the other tools we have are really not very good. And part of the reason they're not very good is that again, there's a focus on transference of knowledge not transference of skill. So when you read a journal journal article, it doesn't make you more skilled, right? It, you know, and, and I always sort of laugh because those of you who've spent time in a basic science lab, you know, a big part of your paper is materials and methods. And I, I think that in every surgical ar article, there should be a section on how, how you get the results you're talking about specifically. Like I do this, then I do this, then I do this. Because if not, then I just read the article and I say, well, I guess, I guess I should send my transgender patients to San Francisco and my deep flat patients to UT Southwestern, but I actually wanna get better at these things. And so how do I get better in terms of skill, not in terms of knowledge, right? And so in the transparency in surgery, uh, both for our outcomes and how we achieve superior outcomes is incredibly poor. And we're much more akin to Sisyphus rolling the stone up the mountain than we are uh, to some of our other analogous experts. Uh, a couple of months ago, I was talking to an executive at ESPN uh, and, and we were just at a dinner together and, and um, he was asking me about what I'm interested in in surgery. And I said, I'm actually interested in how surgeons get better over time. And he said, you know, at, at ESPN, we have two types of uh, on-air personalities. We have um, professional sports journalists like you know Kevin Nagandi, uh, Bob Lee, and we have ex-professional athletes like people like you know Booger McFarland. And I never thought I would ever be able to give a talk where I would have a picture of Booger McFarland uh, in my talk, but now I've done it, so I can cross it off the list. Um, so Booger McFarland. It, is a, a commentator and uh, used to be a professional football player. And what this executive said was that almost uniformly, the, the half of the on-air talent that are ex-athletes ask nightly, daily for feedback. They're, they're obsessed with it. And maybe it's because they haven't been doing it for so long, maybe, but it's also their culture, right? Athletes are used to being critiqued. 
what can I do better? How can I improve that? Was that a good sentence? Was that a good translate, a transition? Um, how am I using my hands? All these things. And the professional journalists almost never do that, right? So it is two different cultures doing the same thing. The ex-athletes are driven to improve utilizing the same tools that made them ex high level professional athletes. Those of you who watched the last dance, you know, a lot of that was focused on practice and how big a jerk Jordan was in practice. Um, and he was hard on people and he was, he, he didn't give any one quarter uh, and uh, practice was not particularly fun. Uh, but every day practice, 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 practice. And it focused on particular aspects of the game. They didn't just get out there, throw a ball in the middle of the court and say, okay, let's practice for two hours. You know, let's run five on five and, and see if we're gonna get better that way. It was specific things that they worked on and worked on and worked on to get better. Practice and surgery, um, again, totally different, right? We think about getting better as well. Now I've done 500 free flaps. Now I've done a thousand free flaps and here's how I've changed and here's how I've gotten better. Dennis Orgill from the Brigham wrote a great paper a couple of years ago on um, statistical process control and how long it takes surgeons once they're done training to get into what, what's known as statistical process control for a breast reduction. And it takes eight years. And it takes eight years because once you're done, you just keep doing it and then you get better a little bit at a time and maybe you pick up something here and there, but it's a terrible way to improve uh, in a deliberate fashion. Uh, and so, so we don't really have deliberate practice. We tend to do things the same way. It's always game time for us. And the goal, right, and you know, I, I've talked to my residents about this recently. The, the goal for a lot of us is, you know, a good operation is one where you're relaxed and it's easy and you're not stressed. And, and that may be true, but you're not getting better during that time. Right, any more than, you know, if you go out for a jog and your heart rate never goes up, you can go out for a jog, but you're not getting more fit. And the reason you know you're not getting more fit is because it's too comfortable. Your, your body's telling you that you're not changing. In sports, coaches play a huge role, right? There, there's no great team without a great coach. Uh, there's no great team where the coach has not been recognized as a major uh, um, force in achieving the excellence the team has achieved. In surgery, coaching is like a black hole, right? There's no coaching, right? There's no, no getting better. And maybe, again, it's cultural or psychological, but, and, and this is coming in, in, in little pockets around surgery, but it's a giant problem. So if we were gonna rewrite, redesign surgery, if we had a blank slate, what would we do? What would it look like? Let's establish, some goals. So one goal would be to establish a culture of deliberate practice in surgery. And, and again, we're, we're getting there uh, in the talk. The other would be to produce, a, uh, produce as many high performing surgeons as we can, right? If the supply of great surgeons goes up, the cost of healthcare will go down. Uh, that should be our goal. Um, it is relatively easy in 2020 to point out that surgeons are different. There are, there's an in, a growing data set that shows this. Pointing out how or why surgeons differ is more difficult and fixing that difference is even more difficult, but I think it's critical. So that leads me to um, this man, uh, Anders Ericsson and uh, his idea of deliberate practice. And Anders Ericsson, um, uh, recently passed away, but was a cognitive psychologist in the um, latter part of the 20th century, early 21st century. And all he did was um, study experts. That was his area of, of expertise and of, of academic uh, focus. What makes people an expert at anything they do? How do they become an expert at anything they do? And he was a guy who came up with this idea of deliberate practice. And so deliberate practice got the, the biggest um, uh, boost in terms of public recognition in Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers. Um, he, um, 
you know, he quoted the 10,000 hour rule to become an expert in anything. And, and so it's, it's sort of interesting. So there's a picture, by the way, just for you guys, um, the, the younger folks. Uh, these are two of the four Beatles, uh, George Harrison on the left, John Lennon on the right, Stu Sutcliffe, not one of the Fab Four, but in the band when they went to Hamburg, um, is in the middle. And um, so, you know, Gladwell says, uh, well, the Beatles spent 10,000 hours practicing in Hamburg. But Erickson actually points out that this is actually not exactly what he meant by deliberate practice because they, they were playing. They played for 10,000 hours in Hamburg. Um, and so th they're, it's not exactly an example of deliberate practice, but sort of a nuance. Uh, the important thing that came out of this is that there's no point at which performance maxes out and further deliberate practice does not lead to improved performance. So what that means is that no matter how good you are, uh, further deliberate practice can make you better. What's the difference between naive and deliberate practice? Well, there are a couple of things that are germane to surgery. One is uh, deliberate practice requires setting a specific goal, not just sort of getting better um, or getting faster or whatever, but setting a specific goal. Um, there's a giant difference between repetition and practice. And so in one of Erickson's books, he talks about uh, you know, drivers, like you, dri people after they've been driving for 20 years aren't better drivers than people who have been driving for two years. Um, and there's good data from insurance claims on that. Uh, if you are a tennis player and you're a functional tennis player and you go out uh, to play tennis every week, um, and, and you, don't, uh, you don't engage in deliberate practice, you will probably be a worse tennis player after 20 years of doing this than you are today because you'll be a little bit older. Um, you'll never learn to hit that high topspin backhand that gives you trouble because you only get that shot hit to you a couple of times a game, and so you don't bother uh, learning how to do it. It's pretty fun to just go out and play so you don't push yourself. You haven't identified something specific on which to improve. You haven't developed methods for working on that something or obtained feedback um, or, or um, contributed the focus to your process that deliberate practice demands and that improvement requires. Um, importantly, and, and this is going to be another sort of pillar of this talk, you haven't spent time on your mental representations. And so we'll talk a little bit about mental representations. In surgery, um, you know, again, we think about improvement as just repeating, do it more, do it over again, keep doing it. Um, it doesn't work so well. We don't typically identify something specific. We identify something general like outcomes, right? At the, an outcome is derivative of lots of individual little things that you've done correctly or efficiently to achieve an end. It's not, an, it's not uh, the thing itself. It's a derivative metric. Uh, goals are not usually related to the task. Uh, feedback, again, like coaching, is poor to non-existent. And we haven't done a lot of work to share our mental representations. So how do you identify a goal for performance? So you, you find an expert. So if I were going to start doing phalloplasties, I would... Um, study Baubach and I would find out um, how he does what he does and I may spend time watching him uh, and I would ideally want to set up a way to judge what I do against what he does on a pretty granular basis. Uh, not just, you know, did it work, did it live? Like that's not very granular, it's not very helpful. Or how long did it take you? Oh, it's still taking me much longer. But on a much more specific granular basis than that. Uh, importantly, I want to know what, what his mental representations are for the different parts of the operation. Not what you're doing, but what are you thinking about? What is your mental representation about that? So, and, and we'll get to that a little bit uh, more further on. Again, practice is sort of like uh, you, you're spending time thinking about specific goals. Repetition is just sort of autopilot, right? I'm just going to do it again. I'm going to do it again. I'm going to do it again. Hope I get better. So on the right is a picture from a, a, a Coors Light ad. It's a bunch of guys out on a golf course playing one-handed golf, drinking Coors. 
um, looks really fun, right? That's a really fun day, no pressure, no one's, no one's concentrating too hard. Uh, it doesn't matter if the ball goes 11 feet, it's fun. On the left is someone engaged in deliberate practice. All she's doing is learning how to hit out of the sand using the rake drill. She's gonna do it again and again and again and again. Not that fun, uh, but this is how you get better at hitting shots out of the sand. So um, the, the next clip is um, a picture, uh, is, is from uh, uh, I think one of the great movies of the, of the 20th century. And uh, it focuses on uh, a program that was started to uh, address the deficiency of expertise in the military. You are the top 1% of all naval aviators. The elite, best of the best. We'll make it better. So the Top Gun School was founded um, to address the fact that our uh, military pilots had gotten uh, worse over time at uh, dogfighting. And um, it was a conscious effort to address uh, uh, deficiencies of expertise in that area by doing things like deliberate practice. And so a lot of what the Top Gun School in reality was designed to do was break down a, a uh, monolithic act of fighting another uh, jet fighter in the sky into components, teach those components, give feedback, set goals, push people to, to improve, and it, it was very effective at doing that. Uh, mental representations are incredibly important, and it's also something that in surgery, we spend almost no time communicating. A mental representation is a mental structure that corresponds to an object, idea, collection of information, or anything else, concrete or abstract, that the brain is thinking about. So uh, hitters in the major league are excellent at uh, developing and, and um, uh, possessing mental representations of where a ball is going to be right after it's released from the pitcher's hand. And so if you or I were at the plate, we would say, well, I'm going to wait until as long as possible to have as good an idea as possible of where that ball is going to end up. If you're a, a major league hitter, you've developed mental representations from the what the ball looks like in the pitcher's hand right after it's released to tell you that ball is going to be exactly here in a fraction of a second. Uh, the same is true in surgery. We, the, the better you are at something, the more developed your mental representations tend to be of what's behind that layer, what if I do this, what if I see that, all these things are part of what we've developed. Uh, this has been well studied in, in sports, in chess, Magnus Carlsen on the right, a young Wayne Gretzky on the left. From his earliest years, Gretzky was able to articulate that he had this ability to uh, pull up a mental representation of where, you know, all 11 other players on the ice were going to be uh, in a fraction of a second. And, and he could close his eyes and picture not where one guy was going to be, but where everyone was going to be, and it allowed him to be as good as he, as he was. Joined by Curry. Gretzky, right past the Curry. He scores! Right, so... Gretzky had a mental representation of where Yari Curry was going to be. He knew it, and he was able to draw on that mental representation and put the puck exactly on Curry's stick um, because he had developed this over time. Chess, the same way. If you ask chess grandmasters to reconstruct chess boards, they're able to do this not because they have superior memory, per se, but because they have mental representations of each of these games They've seen it before. They know what's going to happen next. They know what the opponent's going to do next, and then next, and then next. It's what makes them great chess players. Surgery, we have mental representations. We don't communicate them. We don't spend time developing them, and it's a problem. So after action report is another component. You may say that, well, we have this. This is M&M, &M, but 
you know, I think if we're honest, M&M in most places, in most cases, is sort of a joke. It's, uh, it's a very rough representation of an after action report. Uh, we don't say, what do we set out to do? What actually happened? Because we don't really know what actually happened, right? It's all based on sort of hearsay. Uh, well, this is how I remember it. It's probably the patient's fault anyway. Why is there a difference between what we set out to do and what actually happened? And what should we change and what should we continue? Ideally, this should happen from m and It should also happen after cases that go really well, right? We should have an after action report analog to talk about that. Again, going back to the greatest movie of all time. Johnny. Aircraft One becomes a split S? That's the last thing you should do. The mate's right on your tail. Three there, please. The MIG has you in his gun sight. What were you thinking at this point? You don't have time to think up there. If you think, you're dead. Well, that's a big gamble with a $30 million plane, Lieutenant. Unfortunately, the gamble worked. The MIG never got a clean shot. Maverick makes an aggressive vertical move here, comes over the top, and he defeats the bandit with a missile shot. The encounter was a victory, but I think that we've shown it as an example of what not to do. Next. So in, in rethinking this, we've sort of, at Montefiore, um, developed our own uh, more robust after-action report. Dr. Garfine performs a free fibula flap in an irradiated vessel depleted neck. That's the last thing you should do. The patient is incredibly sick. Freeze there, please. The arteries are very small and diseased here. What were you thinking at this point? You don't have time to think in there. If you think, you're not doing it the same way you've always done it since residency. Well, that's a big gamble with a real live patient, Dr. Garfine. Unfortunately, the anastomosis worked. The flap never went down. Dr. Garfrey makes an aggressive microsurgical move here. Comes into the neck and reconstructs the jaw with the chimeric fibula flap. The operation was a success, but I think we've shown it as an example of what not to do. So we're gonna finish up by talking about Nick and Sumit a little bit more. So deep flaps are an interesting operation to study. It's a complicated operation, high stakes, relatively new in the canon of reconstructive surgery and common. When I was training, uh, deep flaps were like a high wire act. It was a big deal. Uh, you ate special food before it. You, uh, you, know, you brought your sleeping mat in to um, the OR, you told your family you wouldn't be heard of, uh, heard from for, for days. Bob Allen, who sort of was the early father of this operation, published this paper, and I remember reading it, um, thinking there's no way, literally it's impossible to imagine doing a bilateral deep flap in seven hours. Just impossible. Um, but you know, there he was, with these unbelievably fast times that no one was really close to uh, replicating. Um, deep flaps were sort of like sort of like a, a marathon de Saab. You know, it's a 156 mile race through the Sahara. It was painful. You were exposed. Um, just it was. They were brutal. And we thought of them sort of monolithically, like, you know. It was just one thing, right? It was just a deep flap. It wasn't parts of a deep flap. Uh, we just wanted to get tissue from the abdomen to the chest and have it survive, period, end of story. So over the last you know, five to eight years, uh, Nicholas and Sumit have started to think about this operation fundamentally differently. Um, and not just think about getting better, but thinking about the ways they could get better and how to really push the envelope of what people think is possible in this operation. And they've written extensively about their thought process. Um, and so I'm not gonna play this whole video, but 
This is from PRS. I'm Nicholas Haddock, and I'll be presenting our approach to the internal memory vessel preparation. But but in this in this video, Nicholas is sort of going through the second step is perichondrial incision. His process. I'm Nicholas Haddock, and I'll be presenting. Uh, and you can watch it where the where the real um, change happened was with the publication of their I think most recent paper, but this is their you know, Gantt chart essentially for how they do that, how they think about this operation. And so the different colored boxes are the different players, surgeon one, surgeon two, resident one and resident two, um, what they're doing when in the operation uh, and time on the Y axis. And I would argue that the specifics of this are not so important, uh, but the way they think about it is incredibly important and has resulted in really fundamental changes to the operation in their hands. Their process over the last uh, several years has been to identify specific goals, focus on individual parts of the operation, rigorously approach each part, and develop uh, incredibly robust mental representations of this operation. In 2017, they focused, it, they focused on the IMA harvest, then they focused on uh, perforator selection, uh, 2019 was the entire flap harvest as a, a choreographed segment of the operation. Uh, and then uh, this year on staggering patients optimally to uh, decrease total operative time. Uh, so I asked uh, Nicholas and, and Sumit to send me a video of how they do what they do. Academy. I know this is the perf decision has been made. The flap is reflected. This is a right DIP flap. Um, and it's uh, set up or two attending approach. We have identified two perforators. They're lateral. This is small perforator. We call that a medium perforator. So uh, surgeon A is opening fascia. Uh, we are now trying to coordinate both of them together. And I'm going to open lower fascia. Uh, we're going to essentially dissect and attack both perforators at the same time and join it to the pedicle. Blind deals. And so when, he, when they sent the video, I said, yeah, but I really want your, I want your mental representation. I don't just want to sort of have you narrate, you know, what you're using, what tool. I don't, I don't really care that you're using Blondiels or uh, I want to know what you're thinking. Now, those of you who know Sumit know that he's an artist. He's a really accomplished artist. Um, and, and I said, you know, Sumit, I want you to close your eyes and tell me what you're thinking when you're doing this, because that's going to help me develop my own mental representation. And so you don't have to read this entire thing, but I thought it was fantastic, right? This is what uh, Sumit is thinking when he's harvesting a perforator. And he, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's uh, channeling the inner tiger, right? He, he is gonna, on the prowl, he um, is looking for the perforator, he pounces on it. Uh, and so this is actually a great description of a mental representation. He can close his eyes and uh, put himself at the table and he knows exactly what he's thinking, feeling, seeing, and this is part of the reason why they're so good. Here's a graph of their performance over the years. And you know, when you look at number of flaps, it's gone up. This was for a half a year or, or uh, you know, 40% of, of 2020. And you see what's happened to their time sort of as they've gone from, you know, sort of where young deep flap surgeons begin, 11, 12 hours for a bilateral, down, 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 down to an average of about uh, a little over three hours. And now uh, obviously a, a super fast bilateral in two hours and 14 minutes. It's not magic, right? It's sort of deliberate, deliberate practice. If they could decrease time, could we use similar approaches to decrease complications or length of residency training or improve outcomes or, or look at cost? And I would argue, sure, right? These are just other outcome measures that are derivative of how we do the process. And if we make our process better, all of these things will get better. At Montefiore, we've begun to look at this as a division. And I will tell you, uh, it is an interesting journey and not always an easy one. Um, I'm sort of a Ray Dalio disciple. Those of you who, who follow uh, finance, you know, I, I think the culture of radical truth and radical transparency is 
incredibly in, uh, important. Uh, we are, have started to partition monolithic cases into segments, analyze differences among surgeons, share procedural knowledge within and outside of Montefiore, and then say, and then ask the question, if we're not the same, why are we not the same? Uh, Manifest Surgery is a project of mine on the side. It's a mobile app to identify and communicate component parts of operations to share mental representations. Uh, I want to facilitate surgeon to surgeon micro coaching so that if I'm using the SAFA phalloplasty protocol, uh, it's not just that, but where are we different? How might I get better? Um, what are the mental representations used to achieve superior results? I think we have to move towards transparency and honest conversation. And so that's what we built uh, Manifest for. Um, here uh, are two screenshots from the uh, beta version. It'll be in the app store in about a month or six weeks, I think. Uh, Jamie Levine's phalloplasty protocol written by one of his residents, John uh, Beckish. But you see sort of like the steps, um, you know, on, on the, on the uh, left is sort of my screen of shared protocols. On the right are the steps of the fallow uh, in Jamie's hands. And then you drill down to some uh, detail about how they do what they do. And where this is important is I, I wanna just ask Jamie about specific things. Like you do it this way, why, why do you do it that way? What are you thinking? Um, you, you know, what is your mental representation around this, this uh, practice? Take homes are that in surgery that we don't really practice. We only play. We don't share our mental representations. We really don't coach each other, but we can fix all of these things. And I'll leave you with one last clip. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. So to choose to improve uh, is hard uh, at anything, uh, but I think we have to do it and we have to set up the structure to do that in surgery. Uh, we have to learn how to develop mental representations and to communicate them. Uh, we have to design a system to improve at specific parts of operations that are important, that determine, uh, at least in part, our outcomes. Courage is incredibly important. We have to uh, foster a, a professional community that's honest enough uh, and courageous enough to be honest with ourselves. Uh, and something that's not a problem um, for everyone at Bunky, I know personally, um, I think this is a thing that we're already best at, to be generous with our skills and with our knowledge. Um, I've run a little bit over. I apologize for that. I want to thank you all for this opportunity to, uh, to spend time with you this morning. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Evan, thanks so much. Uh, really an interesting topic, and I think um, a talk that I think pretty much all surgeons should hear. Um, and it's a very difficult thing. Like you said, you know, we, we get trained in this kind of graduated responsibility model and um, we, we kind of observe our attendings and our fellows and try to pick up pointers, but there, there really is no deliberate practice model in surgery, as you, as you mentioned. And it's hard to, sometimes you're able to look at a, a master in your residency or training and, and try to, I actually identify what he or she does um, and try to apply that to your own practice. But I think oftentimes it's difficult to actually, you, you see that they're great, but you're not quite sure how they're great, like what they're doing differently. Um, and I remember specifically in, in residency, seeing you know one of our master hand surgeons, um, who's a fairly senior guy, um, do an operation and it was just incredibly smooth, even though you were the one doing it, you know, then the next day you do the exact same operation with somebody else and it's just a huge, huge struggle and you're trying to figure out what the difference was, right? And I think short of um, you know having a video recording of it, it's really it's almost difficult to um, to, to to tell what the difference is. Now um, I had a question about 
um, kind of where you see this uh, this going? Are you basically um, essentially trying to almost crowdsource from surgeons who are very good and efficient at certain operations and, and trying to have basically examples of, let's say, uh, uh, you know, Nick and Sumit for Deeps and other folks and, and have like a database of stuff that surgeons can then compare themselves to, or where do you see this going? So I think, you, you know, to your, to, your, to your comment, you're absolutely right. I mean, it, it is difficult to, to watch, you know, Joe Upton uh, operate and say like, that looks incredibly easy. In my hands, it's incredibly difficult. Where are we different? That is a difficult thing to do. Um, it's, it's necessary though, to get our hands around that because there's something that's different, right? And it, it's difficult to watch Messi play soccer and say, well, where am I different from Messi? But um, lots of ways, obviously, but, but it doesn't mean that we can't do it. It just means that we have to uh, expend effort to do it uh, and develop systems that make it easier. And whether it's AI for video analysis or any of a hundred of things that people are talking about, um, I, it's gonna be something. Um, I think we have to do it because our outcomes are so different that in, in, in the value-based economy, if you're providing a service of way different value, eventually someone's going to be smart enough to say, well, you shouldn't get paid for it. Um, that, that, that's what I would do if I were controlling the $3 trillion healthcare budget, right? I would just say, well, if you're bad, I'm not going to pay you to do something that you're bad at. Um, right. So I think we have to do this eventually. Where I see this going is, you know, uh, thinking about an operation as component steps in the ether, you know, having a platform for um, for me to look into how you do an operation, and not just read your results or even just watch your video, but say this is how Dr. Safa break thinks about this operation, and, and here's how I think about this operation, and they're not really the same. Why is a really important first step, and so I think we think about operations monolithically. We think about, well, the, the result of a phalloplasty is the neophallus. And, and that's true, but the process by which you get there, and certainly if you're not already the best at the in the world at doing that, for everyone else who wants to emulate your results, um, showing them the, the result is not an effective way at helping them get there. You have to break it down to bite-sized morsels and say, hey, you know, uh, here's where my process is different. Let, let's figure out why and how, how to change. Uh, yeah, that, those are great points. And, and the other question I had to do with how do you take into account um, other aspects of the operation that are not necessarily um, related to the surgeon himself or herself? So clearly there are efficiencies with the institution. There are equipment issues. There's nursing staff, scrub techs, a lot of components that potentially will either impede the operation or, or help speed it up. Does um, does your model kind of take into account those aspects of the operation? Because I can tell you, um, if if you took any of us and put us in another hospital and said, okay, do this replant, um, it would be very challenging because we're so used to the way we do things and the scrub text nurses know exactly how to do that. Is there any way to kind of take that into account as well? It has to be taken into account. Um, and and th this whole hypothesis, the central hypothesis of improvement in surgery, uh, it, it in no way ignores or gives short shrift to the idea that, you know, it takes a village. And if you're, micro if you're you know, operating with a magnifying glass in, outside under a, a banyan tree, it's not going to be the same as a controlled environment with a quarter million dollar microscope. And I get that. Um, I, my personal bias is that uh, if I took you and Rudy and put you anywhere uh, on this planet and said do a replant, that replant would be a lot closer to what you can produce at Funky Clinic than taking any two replant surgeons from anywhere on the planet and putting them in Bunky Clinic and having them do a replant there. And so I, I get it, like it, this is not, the only thing, it's a necessary, you know, it, it's uh, necessary but not sufficient. Um, 
And so it's part of it, right? And obviously mm -hmm. Nick and Sumit have a really efficient machine at UT Southwestern for doing deeps and, and people get in and out of the room quickly. The microscope is never set up backwards. I, that's all part of it. But yeah. I think the biggest part is us. Great. Um, I have a, a couple of other points, and then I'm going to call on Greg Bunkiano. He has a, a comment or question as well. Um, so we had a comment in the in the chat section by our dear friend Hari Venkatramani from um, uh, Coimbatore, India, and um, the the question kind of has to do with um, rewards and recognition. So in sports, and obviously you had a lot of um, sports analogies, and and you know Messi is also one of my favorite players, so I definitely follow him. Clearly in sports, there, is, there are multiple incentives to becoming the best. I mean, some of them are obviously intrinsic. I mean, there's, these are kind of winners and they just really, really want to win. At the same time, the better you are, the more money you make, the more endorsements you get, and the more recognition you receive. Obviously that model isn't quite the same in medicine. So what do you think, um, you know, short of those types of recognitions, those external validation with regards to re rewards and that kind of stuff, is there any other way to, do, do, you, do you see a system in which physicians potentially could get paid more if they can demonstrate that they're more efficient in a kind of a value-based economy? Well, it's happening, right? And so take, again, our, our friends at UT Southwestern, you know, if, if you, can do an operation that, if, if Nick and Sumit do an operation in two and a half hours that takes me eight hours, um, you know, they're gonna do more, they can do more in the same amount of time, right? And surgeons are like tailors, right? We're, we're only making money when our hands are busy. And so if, if you become good and efficient and fast as a surrogate for efficiency, um, you, you can squeeze more into your day, right? Um, so on, on the most, on the coarsest level, you, you can certainly make more money and, and I'm, you know, I'm not a socialist, I, I, I'm okay with that. Um, but I think uh, as we move progressively to, to value-based care, again, if, it's always, I think, helpful to think like your opponent. If, if I were writing checks for healthcare, and I looked at a distribution of reconstructive surgeons or any surgeon and said, well, he, these guys, their outcomes are terrible or they're really expensive. One of the things that I would do is um, penalize them. I'd make it harder for them to inflict harm on the system up to and including saying, look, you can't do that operation here. You're just too inefficient at it. And I think, I, I think about if I were running UT Southwestern, and I showed up there as a, a new microsurgeon, and it took me 14 hours to do an operation, Nick and Sumit doing three, I'm not sure that mm. makes sense. Right? Like we, we yeah. operate on this sort of culture of like, just because we're board certified and credentialed, we can do anything we want. It doesn't really make sense to do that. In sports, in sports that's, that, that, that's uh, factored out by, by, by uh, the pressure of, of the market. Yeah, it, you're definitely right. And, and the other component of that, as you also mentioned in your talk, is um, is pairing that with outcomes as well, right? So the 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 question is, how do you on the two by two grid of you know good, bad, fast, slow? Obviously, you want to be good and fast. You can, but you can also be bad and fast, right? Um, so the the other part of that, as you mentioned, is is trying to come up with metrics to to judge the uh, the eventual outcomes of these operations so that you can um, not just look at quote efficiency and speed, uh, but also the the ultimate outcome of this. Um, you know, a, a six months or a year later, how many of your patients have strictures, for example, if, if you're doing a phalloplasty? Um, so if 100% if, if of them have strictures, does it matter that you did it a couple hours faster than the next guy? Um, and so I think those are, um, as you mentioned, really important uh, parts of that to be able to kind of take into account. Um, I'm going to call. I'm going to call on uh, Greg Bunky. I know you're on. You're on the call here. If, if you have any comments or questions, Greg, are you there? Yeah, thank you, Evan. That was great. It's so different than anything else that we've talked about uh, in this lecture series, and it's a. Uh, it's a. It's fun to think about something completely outside of of microsurgery, but it's such an important topic. And and I think one of the things that that uh, was glaring uh, to me is having been through the system now for you know 35 years or so is to see how the culture of quality has changed through the years you know when we we when i first was around you know, there was 
there was the ABC grading systems, and then it went to everybody was a pass or no pass. So you just had to do something to get to pass. And, and you talk about competition so much, and I think that's such a key motivator for people to get better. This is all about people becoming better surgeons and doing better things for you know society basically and and i think it's changed so much we're now in a uh, the concept of standards you know everything is a state you have to get to a certain standard and then that is acceptable and if you get to that standard then you're okay and then it, it's almost like you you've given up once you get to that standard you can kind of give up because you're in that range that's acceptable to society and to us and and to medicine in general and granted our standards are relatively high but they could be higher and the key is how do we motivate people to get better. It's a it's a motivational thing. And I think competition is a huge one. And I you mentioned it there. And I think it's, I don't know how we instill competition into uh, our, our uh, people that we train, people that are out there that are finished training and they're 10 years into practice. How do they, how do these people at, at UT Southwestern, how did they decide to become better? Was it something that inspired them? Where did it come from? Where did that motivation come from? You know, I just don't, the, those are the, the the topics that I think you're trying to get to, but it's hard. It's very difficult. So, Greg, thanks thanks so much for for uh, listening and and your comments. Uh, I, I think I think competition. You know, when you think about again the process by which we all become surgeons, we're all competitive, right? And and you, you don't get here without being competitive. You're competitive for your bio scores, for your MCATs in residency, you, everyone's competitive, right? That's how, that's how we arrive on this call today. What, what I sort of fundamentally believe is the rate limiting step or the absent ingredient or the enzyme is that if, if I operate in my operating room and, and I don't really know how I'm different from the guys at Bunky Clinic, um, I don't know, you know, I guess they're just better they're trained better, maybe they're smarter, maybe their hands are better. Uh, I, I just, I, I'm already at a point where it's sort of useless to bang my head against the wall because I, don't, I, have, no, I have no method, there's no mechanism, system for improving. However, if even anonymously, even without coming hand in hand to the pinnacle, to the, to the mountain and saying, look, I know I've been doing this for 10 years and I, I have all these things on my CV and I shouldn't be asking for help. Uh, whether that's, you know, going to your friends, which I would have the, the, the luxury of doing or being halfway around the world and saying, I, I've just heard these guys are really good. Let's begin the process, Greg, by saying, here's on a granular level, the way I think about this and the way you think about this. And they're not the same. Okay, now let me attack that problem. I'm competitive by nature. I'm competitive because, uh, you know, I, I'm a surgeon because I'm competitive, right? I want, I always want to be better. I want to improve. What I don't have is a way to compare how I do it to how you do it. And if I don't have the way to compare how we do it, then I'm just left with the derivative, which is the outcome. And at, at that point, it's too, it's too big an elephant to eat, you know? So, so I'm trying to find sort of bite-sized pieces for that elephant. Sure. So, uh, Evan, thank you so much again for for being with us. It's really a topic that I think we um, we all need to think about. Uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to checking out Manifest. Is is the app available um, now for download? So, if you if you request it through Test Flight, it's still in beta. Um, okay. So, if you go to the website, you can uh, you can request it, and we'll get you a Test Flight invitation. Oh, yeah, I awesome. love your thoughts. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much again, Evan. Uh, please say hello to all of our friends in New York City. Uh, stay safe out there. I'm looking forward to hopefully seeing you in person soon. Likewise. Thanks very much. Great. Thanks, Evan. Take care. Have a great day. Bye-bye. You too.